Well, good day. Last time we uh, kind of went back and picked up an issue which I may have, may should have dealt with primarily when we were talking about the Greek and classical influences on Christian ethics. And that was uh, a look at Neoplatonism in particular. And uh, as we look at Neoplatonism, we're also looking not exactly, but we're, we're looking at Manichaeism and Gnosticism in a sense. Not because these are all the same things, but that because Neoplatonism, Manichaeism, and, and Gnosticism are all what we called world denying views of reality. And as world-denying views of reality, this will have a tremendous effect on ethics. If you believe that the world is good, then that will determine your ethics. That is, the way you look at the world, the way you look at God, the way you look at uh, human life and human history and human activity, the way you look at the uh, value of the human body and human individual existence and so forth. All of that depends on whether your basic orientation is world-denying or world-affirming. Now, what I was trying to get across is that there is a tremendous amount of, of uh, misinformation or misunderstanding in modern culture, including uh, in modern academic culture. That assumes that Christianity, because somehow or another this was what they were told, this is what our culture was told in the Enlightenment, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. We were told by the Enlightenment that traditional Christianity is world-denying and that, Christ, that traditional Christianity believes in the essential evil of human beings. And part of that misunderstanding comes from a misunderstanding of some of the Christian theologians that we've talked about so far. It comes from a misunderstanding of Augustine. There's no doubt that Augustine was more world-denying, for instance, than uh, the biblical writers would be. And therefore, he tended to be more ascetic. That is, he tended to consider ethics to be primarily the suppression of worldly, sensual uh, values, the suppression of sexuality, the suppression of the body. But what I was trying to emphasize is that he did not get that emphasis from the Bible. That is not an emphasis in Judaism or in early Christianity. That is an emphasis which he got from his own uh, pilgrimage, so to speak, through Manichaeism and through Neoplatonism. Um, being a Neoplatonist before he became a Christian, was certainly better in terms of world affirming than being a Manichae. But being a Neoplatonist was also world denying in comparison with the Hebrew or the biblical view of the nature of reality. And so a, a, um, an ethic that tends to be ascetic and tends to be world denying was something that the Enlightenment reacted very heavily against. And uh, what I want us to see is that in, in some cases the Enlightenment was, was overreacting to a misunderstanding of the nature of the Christian faith and Christian ethics. Uh, we're going to see this specific, uh, particularly in Nietzsche because Nietzsche considered Christian virtues or Christian ethics to be servile virtues, to be the virtues of the slave and to be world-denying instead of world affirming. And so um, Nietzsche wanted to affirm the goodness of the passions and so forth. And uh, what I'm saying is that that may have been the concept of Christianity that Nietzsche uh, kind of imbibed from his own culture because uh, his own culture uh, in its own way was uh, very or hyper-Victorian. Uh, you know, the uh, royalty of England were themselves Germans originally and uh, and uh, one can understand if uh, one reads 
some of the people that Nietzsche read are, are if somebody had some of the patience of Freud in their office. We can understand why these people, Nietzsche and Freud particularly, would have considered Christianity to be a world denying a, uh, an impassionate, uh, I mean a non-passionate faith, uh, one that really didn't take into consideration the goodness of nature and natural ideas and natural individuality and natural passion. But uh, that comes, as we say, from misunderstanding. So understanding that, that the biblical perspective out of which biblical ethics came was world-affirming, history-affirming, individual life-affirming, uh, we can understand how that uh, some of the other influences in Christianity that came in fairly early in a sense misled some of the thinkers of the Enlightenment. And so we need to turn to 18th and 19th century rationalism. And also going together with this is evangelicalism. The history of thought, um, sometimes deals with action and reaction. And 18th and 19th century rationalism, as I said, is a reaction against what was understood to be Christianity. After the rationalists reacted to Christianity, then there is a religious reaction to rationalism, which we call evangelicalism. And uh, so we need to understand both of these movements which are occurring at the same time. The new era, optimistically referred to as the Enlightenment, offered further challenges to the intellectual and spiritual dominance of Christian theology while also influencing the direction of Christian ethics. Now, I also teach a course in uh, the Bible and modern science, and we spend a tremendous amount of time in that course talking about the relationship of the Bible to the development of modern science, modern thought forms, and so forth. The impact of the Bible on, on Western culture, Western philosophy, Western art, Western uh, uh, ways of looking at things in general. And yet uh, we also note in that course the impact of non-biblical elements on Western culture, particularly Greek philosophy, in the form of Platonism, Neoplatonism, uh, Aristotelianism. And when these Greek philosophies, like Neoplatonism, Aristotelianism, and even to a certain extent Gnosticism and Manichaeism, were kind of identified with the Christian faith, then there was a natural reaction to them. And we see this in the, uh, in the Enlightenment. He says, he calls this new era optimistically referred to the, as the Enlightenment. And the reason why he does this is not because he's the Enlightenment basher, but because uh, what we learn as we go along is that, um, is that sometimes we name our eras while we're going through them in a very optimistic way, as if the period of the Enlightenment was the only period in history of real enlightenment. And uh, after we've gone through that period, then we can look back on it and we can say that there were certainly some very important advances in uh, human thought and in uh, human ethics and other things uh, that occurred during the enlightenment. But that there were some things about the enlightenment that weren't particularly enlightened. And some things about the enlightenment that, that uh, was... Uh, was, was too drastically in reaction to some very positive Christian elements. And so, uh, but whether or, not, uh, whether or not Christianity had these positive elements or not, uh, a great many people in the Enlightenment uh, did not recognize them. And so uh, many people in the Enlightenment became kind of a wedge which uh, eventually produced a division in Western culture between Christian thought 
and so-called modern thought or enlightenment thought. And uh, that's a whole uh, other course, so we can't go into it except to make note of that. So when we talk about ethics today, even when we talk about Christian ethics today, uh, we have to talk about it in post in post-enlightenment terms. In other words, Christianity cannot just skip the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment has produced some very, some very uh, good, uh, has had some very good impact on the history of Christianity and the history of Christian Enlightenment and Christian ethics. And so those have to be taken into account. At the same time, Christian ethics has to critique the Enlightenment in certain ways because the Enlightenment from the perspective of Christian ethics uh, reacted in a too optimistic way about the perfectibility of human beings primarily. In other words, how do human beings become good? The Enlightenment had, from the Christian perspective, a rather naive view of the perfectibility of human beings. And so uh, the reaction of Nietzsche, the reaction of Karl Marx, the reaction of the, uh, uh, of the atheistic romantics like, uh, like uh, Nietzsche and, uh, and even later some of the philosophers of Nazism show that uh, getting rid of Christianity does not necessarily produce a better kind of humanity. And uh, so that's one thing that we're going to have to see in our critique of the Enlightenment. Though again, we do not want to uh, leave the impression that we're Enlightenment bashers because a great deal of what Christian ethics incorporates into its present understanding of the nature of ethics and the nature of culture and the nature of reality, uh, they receive from the Enlightenment of the Enlightenment. And one reason for that, that I would argue, is that the Enlightenment itself is is a stage in the history of Christian ethics. There is a sense in which the Enlightenment philosophers were themselves Judeo-Christian prophets. In other words, they were calling the Christian faith back from its uh, hierarchical, uh, stagnant, uh, ascetic, world-denying situation into which it had gotten itself. They're calling it back to a more world-affirming and more reasonable understanding of the faith. So in that sense, um, one might call some of the Enlightenment philosophers uh, Judeo-Christian prophets. In fact, some of the Enlightenment people, some of the people that are classified as Enlightenment people are themselves uh, highly motivated and highly committed Christians. For instance, uh, we've been looking at Martin Luther and John Calvin, who are, who, who are basically the theologians of the Lutheran Reformation movement and the theologians of the Calvinist or Reformed Reformation movement. But there are a number of American denominations that actually rose out of a kind of an enlightened Puritanism. That is, the impact of the Enlightenment on American Puritanism produced some of the uh, American forms of religious uh, of Christianity. For instance, in in uh, in the uh, religious movement in which I myself grew up, I learned uh, fairly late in life, well, earlier than now, but <laughs> but still fairly late in life, I learned that probably the chief theologian of uh, my religious movement, which is primarily an American religious movement, the chief theologian was John Locke. Well, people don't usually assume that John Locke uh, is primarily a Christian theologian. They assume that he's primarily a philosopher of, uh, of political philosophy and so forth. But uh, uh, if you read John Locke, then you read basically the interpretation of Christianity which characterizes a great deal of American uh, denominational theology. Now even that needs to be critiqued. But at the same time what I'm trying to say is that uh, a, a great many of those that are classified as the Enlightenment 
were people who were trying to interpret the Christian faith. They were not people trying to overturn the Christian faith or destroy the Christian faith. Um, one, for instance, is Bishop Joseph Butler, who is, uh, who is covered in your book, Christian Ethics, A Historical Introduction. Bishop Usher uh, fits, to a certain extent, in the Enlightenment mold in that he is out to find out the natural basis of Christian theology and Christian ethics. It's not that he completely obliterates in his thought the importance of revelation, but he does downplay the importance of revelation because from his perspective, Christianity, Christian theology, and Christian, Christian ethics are the reasonable way of understanding the nature of reality. And so what he's trying to do is to appeal to the, to the new enlightenment, to the new rationalism, and say, well, I'll, uh, I'll agree with you that a great deal of Christianity in the past has been irrational and has been uh, some, in some ways unnatural, especially when it's been mis misinterpreted uh, by even its adherents. But Christianity is really the rational way of understanding the world. Sometimes these people tended later on to scuttle the doctrine of the Trinity along with the doctrine of Revelation. But some of these early Enlightenment people didn't even scuttle the doctrine of the Trinity. They just assumed that, uh, that it was compatible with rationality. For instance, John Locke was a Trinitarian. But uh, from their perspective, you, uh, having the Bible is very helpful. Because, particularly since, the, as they understood it, philosophy could not save anybody. All philosophy could do was kind of describe the nature of reality and the nature of salvation. And so for most people, these Enlightenment people thought, and this is kind of a condescending attitude, but in a sense it's a reflection of reality. For most people, philosophy cannot be their, their means of salvation. You talk to the average person on the street, uh, they're not even going to understand the, the questions that philosophy asks, much less the answers. And so from these people's perspective, some of them, the Bible was very important for the overwhelming mass of mankind, of human beings. But that didn't mean that you could not explicate Christianity in, in completely rational terms. And that didn't mean that you couldn't come to an understanding of what Christians should believe and what Christians should do, almost completely on rational terms. Now, the ground principle with Butler was benevolence. Well, obviously, uh, Butler wouldn't even be talking about benevolence and love, except that he comes out of, of uh, basically the Christian tradition. But... He understands benevolence to have the same relationship to society that self-love has to individuals. Now, that, that is an idea which, uh, which has kind of come to its, into its own in the 20th century. Uh, used to, Christians would talk about Jesus saying, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And what was the emphasis in the past? The emphasis in the past was, Loving yourself is not particularly good, but you should at least love other people as good as you love yourself. Well, what Butler is saying, and what a lot of more modern Christians say, is that that passage also indicates something that was not noticed to a certain extent by Christians in the past, and that is that the Bible actually recommends a certain kind of self-love, that is, if you want to know how to love your neighbor, you need to know what kind of love you should have for yourself. Now, that seems to contradict Augustine, who talks about inordinate self-love and inordinate self-centeredness. But, uh, and, and in a sense, Butler may have thought he was contradicting Augustine. But one thing I want to point out is that 
what Augustine means by inordinate self-love or self-centeredness is not the same thing as what Butler means by self-love. Because what Butler means by self-love is that Christianity, again, is not a world-denying faith. It is not a human humanity-denying faith. Human beings uh, were created and they are given inestimable value by God. From the Christian perspective, the only, pla the only place human beings get their value is from God. Uh, for instance, so what kind of value can you get uh, for the human being totally from the perspective of naturalistic evolution, for instance, or totally from the perspective of, uh, of Nietzschean ethics, uh, or even totally from the perspective of, uh, eg of atheistic existentialism. In atheistic existentialism, there is no value that you receive from the outside, so you have to, in a sense, create your own value. Well, Butler wasn't this far yet. He understood that the value that human beings have uh, comes from God. Uh, even a deist like uh, Thomas Jefferson would have agreed with that. Uh, but Butler is beginning a uh, thought process that will end that would end up in the modern emphasis on the fact that we know what we know how to love uh, our neighbors if we know what it means to properly love ourselves. But that, you see, is one step away from a theology-centered ethic. It's one step away from a God-centered ethic. Because, uh, and I'm sure B Butler understood this, but uh, in order to understand how to love yourself properly, you have to understand again how God loves you. So again, even the Enlightenment uh, theologians uh, did not try to separate their ethic from theology, did not try to separate their ethic from God. They understood that couldn't take place. But they did, they did um, uh, separate their ethic kind of one step from God and started talking about benevolence in a more philosophical sense and self-love in a more philosophical sense. Both are positive dispositions in created human nature. In other words, uh, Butler is going to put off comment on revealed ideas like sin, the fall, and redemption. He's going to emphasize what is natural in the creation. And there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm, what I'm telling you is that the Enlightenment picks up on certain elements of the Christian faith which probably have been uh, downplayed or at least have not been adequately explicated. And one of those is that human beings are by nature created good. In fact, and this is something that some of the Enlightenment people didn't understand, a doctrine of sin or a doctrine of the fall makes no sense rationally unless you believe that human beings are created good. That is, unless you believe that God has given uh, value to human beings. Because if you believe that human beings are created evil, or are naturally evil, then you don't need a doctrine of sin or the fall. You already have your explanation as to why human beings are not what they're supposed to be. So, so over the centuries, Christianity should have been uh, transmitting a balanced understanding of the nature of a human being. That is, that he has, he was, the human being was created good, but that he is fallen. To put it in a kind of a modern existential way, uh, as for instance Paul Tillich or Reinhold Niebuhr would put it, human beings are essentially good but existentially bad. In other words, you cannot believe, you cannot begin Christianity with the affirmation of that human beings are essentially bad. And it is a misunderstanding of Augustine and uh, Calvin to say that that's what they believed. That's what it seems like they believe because we focus on 
their doctrine of sin or their doctrine of uh, idolatry or their doctrine of, of the lack of faith or their doctrine of the fall. But as uh, some modern theologians say, the Bible doesn't begin with the original sin. It, it doesn't do away with some concept of original sin, but it does not begin with original sin. It begins with original blessing. Chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis say nothing about sin. They say nothing about uh, original sin. And they certainly do not connect sin with being human or being bodily or being sexual. So in that sense, the Enlightenment is picking up on, on something that uh, probably had not been adequately explicated by Christianity for a long time. So anyway, just Joseph Butler picks up on the goodness of human nature. And this is one way in which the Enlightenment has contributed to the modern explication of Christian ethics because now Christian ethicists realize that, they should, that, that we should always keep that in the forefront, that is, that human beings were created good. And that sin and the fall are a, uh, are, are, are a subsequent necessity. Once you, get in, once you get it in your mind thoroughly, and uh, foundationally that human beings are good, then if you're going to talk about sin and the fall, you have to talk about it in that light. The problem is that in a lot of uh, Christian teaching and preaching, both in the Middle Ages and even, in the, even after the Middle Ages, uh, the primary focus is on the sinfulness of human beings. Whereas uh, from the biblical perspective, the sinfulness of human beings is only a subject that needs to be brought up because of the essential goodness of human beings. And something that's essentially evil cannot be redeemed. Only something that is good, essentially. Uh, according to Butler, through benevolence and self-love, though they are different, benevolence and self-love, though the former tends most directly to public good, and the latter to private. Now this is what you get into when you, when you study an individual philosopher or theologian. They will have their own language. So um, for a while, because of the influence of Joseph Butler, people will use this language, self-love and benevolence. Uh, these concepts are already inherent in Christian theology and Christian ethics, but just other terms and other, other ways of talking about it were used. But anyway, there are, there are two kinds of love, benevolence and self-love. One has to do with the private. Yet they are so perfectly coincident that the greatest satisfactions to ourselves depend upon our having benevolence in a due degree and that self-love is one chief security of our right behavior toward society. What I would emphasize is that Joseph Butler thinks he is getting this from rational analysis of reality or from philosophy. But I would say that, that he should have looked into the fact that he was actually getting these ideas from Christian revelation, that is from the biblical perspective, and that, uh, and that none of these are in contradiction at all or even in tension with the biblical understanding as long as the biblical understanding is grounded in uh, the Christian's relationship to God and in his self-worth as a gift from God. Jesus, for instance, uh, uh, we'll talk about this when we get to Nietzsche. Jesus, for instance, said that he who would save his life shall lose it. And he said, if you want to follow me, you need to take up your cross. Crucify yourself. Well, Nietzsche and Freud and other people said, well, look at that. Jesus is saying that you should not value yourself. And if you take those scriptures out of context, they have been used that way over the centuries. So that uh, humility or meekness as virtues have been considered 
uh, virtues that derive from the fact that we consider ourselves to be worthless and uh, worms and of no value whatever. And uh, that's not what Christ, what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is that in a sense you have two selves. You have your created self, which is good. You have your fallen self, which is not good. And if he had explicated his views philosophically, he would have said, you need to crucify your fallen self. But that's not the last word. What is the next word? You need to crucify your fallen self so that your true self can be raised. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means to be raised. In other words, from Jesus' perspective, it is true that you should have an adequate and proper self-love. If you understand yourself as the creation of God and as the object of God's redemptive work. And as a matter of fact, and Augustine would agree with this, the reason why you have low self-worth and you don't have proper love of yourself is because you're not, you don't properly love God. So to the extent that Joseph Butler continued that, um, he's, he's really not uh, disagreeing with either Calvin or, or uh, Augustine. And in fact, in just a minute, we're going to uh, talk about Jonathan Edwards, who was a, was a strict Calvinist, but he's considered to be one of the important, if not the most important, American philosopher as well. Now, Butler goes on to say that what happened here? The state with its coercive instruments of armies, police, and prisons is the basic impediment. If the state and the instruments of coercion can be abolished, the new reality of love and the kingdom of God will be free to burst forth. See, this is this optimism about the perfect, perfectibility of human beings. And there are all kinds of both religious and secular uh, Christian and anti-Christian views of the uh, of the abolition of course and the abolition of the state and so forth uh, based on uh, all we have to do is just love one another now what have I done okay All right. Um, when we when we start looking at the nineteenth century philosophical, well, let's see. We haven't. We need to look at the evangelical revival. The evangelical revival is the uh, is the Christian reaction to eighteenth century rationalism, and uh, the chief representatives of the evangelical revival are John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards. In John Wesley, justification occurs with the sinner's recognition both of his or her unworthiness and of the free gift of God's grace. To be justified is to be received as a child of God in the boundless love of God despite that unworthiness. Now, that has to be understood in in the biblical context because you cannot do a biblical ethic you cannot do a Christian ethic without some taking some cognizance of the unworthiness of human beings in some sense if only in the sense that human beings have no obvious value within themselves that is coming from the outside but also in the sense that human beings have fallen away from God and therefore they have, they have been alienated from themselves, they've been alienated from one another, they've been alienated from uh, nature because of their original alienation from God. And if you want to understand basically what the idea of original sin is all about, that's basically it, the original alienation from God has produced alienation with oneself and alienation with everything else. So, 
uh, Christian ethicists cannot begin with the perfectibility of human beings because something has happened that makes the perfectibility of human beings problematic. And so any ethic which simply is an ethic of human fulfillment or human, the fulfillment of human potentiality is not taking into account that it is not possible for humans to fulfill their potentiality without some kind of, of uh, breaking in from without, which is what Christianity means by revelation and by grace. So to be justified, that is to be made righteous, is to be received as a child of God. It's not the result of doing anything because from Wesley's perspective, unlike uh, people in the Enlightenment sometimes, you can't do anything. You can't just grit your teeth and be good. And then God will accept you. From the evangelical perspective, you accept the acceptance of God in order to be good. In other words, there is a relationship to goodness, but the relationship is, is a different one. Uh, Paul Tillich, for instance, who is, who is uh, uh, in this tradition, though he's a much more liberal modern theologian, says that, uh, um, that um, grace is God's acceptance of the unacceptable. And faith is the acceptance of that acceptance. In other words, human beings in Christian ethics have to begin with their relationship to God. Until they, until they are, have some kind of security in their relationship to God, unless they have accepted the acceptance that God has given them, even though they're unacceptable, then they're in no position to be human. They're in no position to be what God created them to be. Now, John Wesley believes in the perfectibility of the human being, but he believes in the perfectibility of the human being only under the power of grace and the Holy Spirit. So that's what... Uh, so Wesley's emphasis on sanctification was expressed in his doctrine of Christian perfection. Just to put it kind of bottom line, the difference between a secular philosophical ethic and a Christian ethic is God. In a secular or philosophical ethic, you can devise from the Christian perspective all kinds of rights and wrongs, but you can't be what you're supposed to be as a human being without God, that is, without the help of God. We are to strive toward perfection. Indeed, we are to expect to be made perfect in this life, but that is, this is not perfection in the Greek sense. This is perfection in the Hebrew biblical sense, which means what? What he meant, rather, was perfection in love. That is becoming a holy, loving person. That's holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Wesley's view, which is Augustine's view, which is the biblical view, both Old and New Testament, is that human beings were created to be fully human. That's why Adam, the human being, was created, to be a human being. That's why God, from the biblical perspective, limited himself in the creation of a human being. That's why I emphasize the difference between the Greek philosophical view of God and the biblical view of God. The Greek view of God, the one, is not limited in any way. The biblical view of God is that God has deliberately, consciously, self-limited He's limited himself. And just by creating human beings who have, the, who have the freedom to be something other than God, he has, by that very act, limited himself. And uh, not only that, but by extension, God has given human beings the possibility not only of loving, that is, fulfilling their their humanness, but he's given them the freedom also to not love. 
which is what sin means. So when people ask a Christian theologian, why did God create human beings if he knew they were going to sin? Well, in a sense, that is a, um, th that is a question that can't be asked properly. Because if you did not create someone who had the possibility of sinning, then you're not creating human beings. Because what sin is, is simply the, the failure to fulfill the purpose for your creation. The purpose for your creation is to be fully human. We are not, we were not angels. You know, there's this little myth that uh, a lot of people still have of uh, a baby being born. And what has happened is that there's a shelf up in heaven with all of these little angels sitting on it. And they're waiting to be born. So when, uh, when a woman gets, uh, gets pregnant, so, you know, some other angel taps one of these little angels on the shoulder and they come down and, and become a human being. Uh, that that's that's a, a very pagan myth because it does not understand the nature of what it means to be human. We were never angels. We will never be angels. We were meant to be human beings. And the fact that we are not fully human is our problem. That's the problem that uh, the doctrine of sin or the doctrine of the fall is trying to explain. In other words, the doctrine of sin is not a made-up idea just to try to uh, uh, gi give you a dogma to believe. It's an idea which is trying to understand what you experience and what you see every day of your life. That is, you are not, you don't even, you even sense it yourself that you are not what you were meant to be. And so... Uh, from the beginning then, the biblical assertion is that human beings were created to be human and there's nothing wrong with being human. It was God's idea. And not only that, but uh, categorically speaking, a human being cannot be anything higher than a human being. But there's nothing wrong with that. A human being is not God. Now in Neoplatonism, in which uh, there is a that there, in which there is a negative connotation to being human, that is to having bodies and being sensual, uh, that's because for Plato, there were these immortal souls sitting up in heaven, in a sense, waiting to be born into a human body. And that at, at the end or the death of the human body or at the end of the redemption process, however you look at it, what the soul is trying to do is to rid itself of the human body. So you see, what the Enlightenment was trying to correct, that is, the, the seeming world-denying, uh, anti-human, anti-life perspective in Christianity, what they were trying to correct was already uh, within the Christian tradition, but it just wasn't, it just wasn't uh, developed as it should have been. Uh, during the Middle Ages. So Wesley goes back to the, to the idea that um, he will agree with the Enlightenment that human beings were meant to be perfected. They were, they were created to be fulfilled. But he still retains the biblical, the Augustinian, the Calvinist view that they cannot do that unless they recognize that they are absolutely dependent upon God not just for their perfection, but for their very existence. So if you're, if you're absolutely dependent upon God for your very existence, for your, for your value, for the uh, model of what a human being is supposed to be, and therefore for human perfection, then uh, it's, not, it's not going to forward or advance that desire to cut ethics off from its theological source. Jesus uses the word perfection. You remember the statement where Jesus says, be you perfect 
as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, because, because of the... Uh, because of the understanding of our Greek cultural ancestors about what perfection is, this has been a very hard saying for most Christians because they read that and they go away disheartened or they go away uh, depressed because there's one thing that they know if they don't know anything else by their own experience and that is what? We are not perfect and we cannot be perfect in that Greek sense. We cannot be perfect physically. We cannot be perfect emotionally. We cannot be perfect uh, spiritually. We certainly can't be perfect morally. So when, when someone reads Jesus as if he were a Neoplatonist or something like that, and he says, you must be perfect as God is perfect, then that is uh, that just is a mind-blowing idea. And so that's the reason why we have to understand perfection as John Wesley did in the biblical sense. That is, we must be perfect in love. And the word perfect there means mature. Again, nobody, even John Wesley understood this, nobody in this life can become perfect in love in the Greek sense. But you can become perfect in love in the biblical sense because Jesus, in, in that same quotation, um, explains what that means. And sometimes we don't read the next verse. We read the verse that says you should be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But then we don't read the next sentence, which is what? He sends his reign on the just and the unjust. And he makes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. What's that got to do with perfection? Well, that's the kind of perfection which God expects of human beings. That is, they treat people as infinitely valuable persons without any conditions. So John Wesley... And this has, been a, this has been a controversial doctrine in Christianity ever since because Calvinists uh, basically are, are uh, averse to this doctrine of Christian perfection. And so even, uh, even modern Methodists and Wesleyans don't emphasize it near as much as they used to do. Uh, but again, I think it's because it's a misunderstanding of what Wesley was saying. Wesley was not dumb enough to think that we could, uh, under our own power, become perfect, uh, even in the biblical sense. He certainly didn't believe that we under our own power could be, become perfect in any kind of absolute sense. But there's another little verse under that. Wesley did not believe that even with God's help could human beings in this life become perfect in the absolute sense. But he did believe that with God's help, human beings could be perfect in the Hebrew biblical sense, that is, of mature and have a mature loving attitude toward people uh, Christians from Wesley's perspective would still have to consider themselves to be sinners saved by the grace of God and and uh, Christians uh, in, a, in a theological sense would still always at all times be living a life of repentance because repentance is not something that you just do once and then it's done Repentance from Wesley and other Calvin and other people's perspective is something that is a continuous relationship to God. That's not, that doesn't mean that we are always depressed because we're sinners. In fact, from, from, uh, that's misunderstanding of what sin means in the Christian faith. Uh, the uh, repentance from sin, the acknowledgement of sin, and the reception of forgiveness actually gives us a more enhanced uh, sense of security and, uh, and love and forgiveness. And so the purpose of repentance is not just to be sad and, uh, and uh, depressed all the time about the fact that I'm not perfect. The, perfect of, the purpose of repentance is to, in a sense, put yourself in the hands of God so that he can make you perfect. 
so that he can perfect you. So it's really a, it's really from the uh, Christian perspective, a joyous activity, repentance. It's not a, uh, it's not a uh, sad or depressing activity. What would be sad and depressing from the Christian perspective is if we did not know of our need for repentance and did not repent. So a loving person is no longer enslaved to animosities or self-centeredness. And that means, again in kind of modern terminology, a loving person is a fully human person. Because that's what human beings were intended to be. Now Jonathan Edwards is an interesting example because he is a stark Calvinist. And unfortunately, most Americans only know one thing about Jonathan Edwards. If you studied American literature, did you read about Jonathan Edwards? You remember reading about Jonathan Edwards. When I was studying American literature, they may not, lots of people may not read about him at all anymore, which is incredible because you really can't be uh, know much about American literature and American history without knowing Jonathan Edwards. But the only thing that was in my American literature book from Jonathan Edwards was a paragraph from his sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. You might want to try to find that because uh, after I tell you what the sermon was about, you might want to read and check up and see if I'm right. In Sinners with the Hands of the Angry God, the paragraph that is usually put in our American history or American literature books is the one where Jonathan Edwards describes a human being as a spider held on a string over a fire. Well, that's not a very pretty picture, you know, <laughs> to conceive of God as kind of this wide-eyed person that's holding a spider over a fire. And Jonathan Edwards says, in terms of our inherent self-worth and our inherent goodness, uh, God should just let go so that we'll fall in the fire. Well, a lot of people who don't know Jonathan Edwards and who haven't read the rest of the sermon think that that's the primary message of the sermon. That is that God is this kind of ogre who is holding us over a fire and if we don't get in line, he's just going to let us go. But what Jonathan Edwards is saying is that's the way it should be. But it's not. <laughs> Because of the grace of God. In other words, Jonathan Edwards' primary subject in all of his sermons is the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. And so what he's telling people, uh, what he's telling people, what he's trying to get people to do is to respond to the grace of God, not to respond to being held over a fire, but to respond to the grace of God. What, in other words, what he's telling people who are, who are putting their faith uh, in the goodness of God is that that's not something they have to worry about because God is overwhelmingly good and overwhelmingly gracious and so uh, you have to under, understand uh, um, Jonathan Edwards theological background which is highly Calvinistic uh, to understand why it is such an irony that that uh, Jonathan Edwards is considered to be one of the great, if not the greatest, American philosopher. Because when he turns to philosophy, he's actually uh, speaking in philosophical terms about this grace of God. Edwards argues that virtue does not consist in our love of particular things or particular beings. In fact, an overarching love in particular beings would be what? 
an overwhelming love for particular beings would be idolatry. Even other people. We can't, we can't uh, deposit absolute love even in other people that we love. As such, rather it consists in benevolence to being in general. You see, he's picked up uh, Bishop's word, benevolence. It consists in benevolence to being in general. Now, when you're, when you're a philosopher and you're talking about being in general, what language do you use if you're a theologian? Abstractly considered, being in general refers to the great system of universal existence. He argues no exercise of love or kind affection to any one particular being, that is, but a small part of the whole, has anything of the nature of true virtue. In other words, in fact, it has the potentiality of sin, of idolatry. Love as some aspect of being, whether that be an object of beauty, other human being, a whole nation, can in fact stand over against our love of being in general. For instance, hyper-nationalism, like Nazism or fascism, what is that? That's the love or the... Uh, overwhelming attention to uh, nationhood or to peoplehood or to race. And so love of race in the sense in which fascism, Nazism and other kinds of nationalism uh, which they consider to be virtue. Jonathan Edwards says you're, you're, you're tripping up because you're, you're not directing your love toward being in general. And therefore, uh, your love toward individual beings can become distorted and actually harmful and dangerous to other human beings. These lesser objects of love represent private affections, which will set a person against general existence and make him an enemy to it. Now, what would you say then after that? If you transferred, uh, if you transferred uh, Edwards' argument from philosophy, which he's doing here, to more of a faith statement, then what is he saying in simple terms? He's saying the first commandment. You should love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, and then your neighbor... Those are the first two commandments. And so what, what Jonathan Edwards is doing is in philosophical language, uh, just, like, uh, just like the Enlightenment, is, uh, talking about, uh, is talking about Christian ethics in philosophical language, but it still has Christian content. So he's trying, like the Enlightenment people did. Uh, he's brilliant, you know. He's an ultra-brilliant person, and he's trying, like the Enlightenment people did, to explicate the Christian faith in ways that make sense to enlightened people. And so you should not understand Jonathan Edwards simply in terms of sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, when we look at the 19th century philosophical and Christian ethics, you run across, first of all, the uh, kind of mountain of that period, and that's Immanuel Kant. And uh, Kant, of course, is a 19th century Enlightenment thinker, but you also need to understand that he is still in the Christian tradition, and he is basically, he comes from a German pietist tradition. Pietism is kind of the German equivalent of Wesleyanism. So he's not, he's not stepping out of the Christian tradition. What he's trying to do is to put uh, Christian, uh, is to put ethics and, uh, and actually theology on a different uh, foundation. So Kant argues that the morality of an act is not derived from its end or goal, but from its motivation. The only thing that can be said to be morally good, without further qualification, is the good will.
to will the good is to will in accordance with universal law. Kant's categorical imperative calls for us always to act in such a way that the basis, our maxim of our action, could become universal law. Now, Kant obviously is not impressed by simply utilitarian ethics or hedonistic ethics in which the primary goal is to, is to seek pleasure. Because from Kant's perspective, it may be that, uh, that acting in a good way will not be pleasurable at all. Thus with Kant, the moral life is above all life based on duty. We are to do our duty regardless of the unpleasantness of the results. Now that is not, you know, biblical ethics. But on the other hand, uh, the way he describes his categorical imperative is certainly not in conflict with the Christian conception of obedience and love. That is, our uh, duty toward another person uh, has great affinities with the Christian concept of agape. That is, I owe something to another person no matter what. It's just that in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of the grounding, Kant is trying to ground ethics in the autonomous will of the human being, whereas Christian ethics grounds it in the will of God and in the power of God. But when it comes down to it, Kant was not an orthodox Christian, but he still went to church all the time, he said, to fly his flag. And there's a good reason why he should have gone to church, because no matter where, where he tries to ground his ethic, it still turns out to be very similar to, it, 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 it turns out to look very similarly to the Christian ethic of agape and of duty and of obedience. Now, as far as God was concerned, Kant um, critiqued the traditional arguments for the existence of God. And he believed, and uh, you'll just have to uh, look at his philosophy to understand how he comes to these conclusions. He believed that you could not prove the existence of God through reason. He, his, uh, one of his primary uh, subjects is the limitations of reason. So the limitations of reason, one of the limitations of reason, in fact, the chief limitation of reason is that it cannot prove God. You cannot get to God uh, through rational process, uh, through reason. You cannot ground the existence of God in reason. That does not mean he did not believe in God. He still believed in God. And there had to be some connection, tenuous or otherwise, uh, between his ethic and God. But he, instead of the uh, cosmological and ontological arguments for the existence of God, he developed what he called the moral argument for the existence of God. In other words, uh, you can't prove that God exists by looking at nature, but you can postulate the existence of God as necessary to the grounding of morals. And so this is the kind of thing that's in the air uh, for instance, in, in some of the leaders of the American Revolution. They didn't want to be Orthodox Christians. They wanted their theology and their ethics to be rationally grounded. But at the same time, they understood, or at least they believed, that however tenuously it might be grounded and however mysterious the connection, there could be no morality and in the case of Jefferson and, and some of the other guys, there could be no civilization, there could be no republic without the grounding of morality in God. And uh, Jefferson, for instance, uh, put out his own little Bible 
called the Jefferson's Bible, uh, Jefferson's Bible. And what Jefferson does in this Bible is that he cuts out all of the, what he considers to be the non-rational or irrational aspects of the Bible and all of the miracles and so forth. And he leaves all of the moral sayings of Jesus because he still, he has a high regard for Jesus. And he has a high regard for Jesus' morality. But he just doesn't want to ground it like his orthodox uh, preacher buddies. <laughs> he doesn't want to ground it in theology or in revelation. But uh, what, I want to, what I want to see as the bottom line is that ethics, whether it is specifically Christian, evangelical, pietistic, are rational, or whether it is secular rational. In the 18th and 19th century, still cannot be understood except as a part, an extension of the tradition of Christian ethics. Uh, Hegel is an interesting philosopher. He was kind of an arrogant so-and-so, but he, in a sense, had, uh, had the right to be arrogant because if you've ever tried to read one paragraph or one page of his philosophy, you realize that he had a mind that, uh, that uh, was incredible. You have to really be interested in, in understanding to spend the time trying to understand Hegel. Uh, Beginning with pure, and he believed that after he after he had published his philosophy, there wasn't weren't there, there wasn't any more need for another philosopher. <laughs> so anyway, he begins with pure will and abstract right. These two things have to kind of get together in actualization or in actuality. He describes the moral life as the unfolding process whereby both came into actual existence. Hegel is the one, you know, who uh, spoke in terms of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And from his perspective, the, the whole process of reality was the development of a thesis, an antithesis, and then a synthesis. And then that synthesis becomes a thesis to which there's an antithesis. And in this way, the whole of reality uh, comes together finally in the absolute. That's true in terms of... Uh, of the nature of God, as well as the nature of, uh, of morality. So the will is internal, it's subjective. It is the I that is empty of any actual content. In itself, it is neither moral nor immoral. But abstract right is moral principle not yet embodied in actual existence. You might say there's a little Platonism here or Aristotelianism left uh, in that there is an abstract right or moral principle and then uh, there is the I which responds to that abstract right or moral principle and, and actually actualizes it. So when I will in accordance with abstract right, I bring it into existence and at the same time become myself a person. In doing so, I cannot treat other persons as less than the moral will that I am without disintegrating my own personhood. How can you disagree with that? <laughs> the problem is, uh, somebody says, somebody might say, who says? You know, who says? That's the reason why, uh, from the perspective of Christian ethics, you can do all the philosophizing you want to do but the question still comes, who says? Who says this is really the nature of God? And who says this is uh, what I need to do? Uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, according to him, the will is but a particular expression of the will to life, of all life. It is without knowledge, is merely a blind, incessant impulse, its basis is nothing more than need, deficiency, and thus pain. The satisfaction or the pleasing can never be more than the deliverance 
from a want. Now, this is supposed to be the philosophy of the will to life. Uh, as you read it, it almost sounds more like a philosophy of the will to death. Uh, apart from the endless treadmill of needs and wants and their satisfaction, human life is emptiness. And this is one of the results of, uh, of a wide spectrum of Enlightenment thought that uh, comes, to the, comes to the conclusion that human life uh, is emptiness. Karl Marx is an example of uh, another person who cannot be understood except in the light of Christian theology, Christian eschatology, and Christian ethics. Karl Marx' um, reason for existence, his reason for being who he was and writing what he wrote, is that he is trying to fulfill the lack of, that Christian theology and Christian ethics obviously had from his perspective. Uh, Karl Marx, for instance, was not the inventor of the suppression of religion such as happened in, in uh, Marx-Leninism in the Soviet Union. He didn't, uh, he didn't foresee the necessity of suppressing religion. From his perspective, when the, when, uh, when the real nature of reality was properly explicated, then Christianity, and when and when uh, and when the kingdom of God, so to speak, actually began to be realized in human society, then religion would just die. But he was he was not negative at all about early Christianity. He was kind of a scholar of early Christianity, and he considered Christianity to be one of the steps in this dialectical movement, ultimately toward Marxism. Christianity and Christian ethics was just a step that, had, that could not fulfill its promise. So, it is not abstract right and moral will that are actualizing themselves through history. It is concrete history, grounded ultimately in economic forms that are reflected in abstract thought and social institutions. Uh, if you study Karl Marx, and you study interpretations of Karl Marx, one of the things you run across is the idea that, that Marxism is a Christian heresy, which means what? What does it mean to call something a Christian heresy? That's another way of saying what I said at the beginning of this lecture, and that is, in a sense, even these atheistic or non-theistic or anti-Christian Enlightenment philosophers participate to a certain extent in being Christian, Jewish, prophets. That is, Karl Marx points out the failure of Christian ethics in the 19th century. Because if Christian ethics had been operating as, uh, as Christian ethics should have been operating, then the uh, analysis of society that Marx produced wouldn't have been as true <laughs> as it is because Christian ethics was actually operating the way that Marx described it. Then uh, Marx understood himself to be kind of a necessary advance on Christian ethics. In other words, what Christianity, what Christianity could not bring about, he was going to show how it could come about. He wasn't necessarily going to bring it about himself, but he was going to show how it could come about. And so it's that sense in which he is, he is a Christian heretic. He has a Christian heresy because he's picking up on the, on the eschatological vision of Christianity and he's just turning it into a secular vision. And in a sense, that's what modern uh, secular liberalism is. It is a secularized version of Christian eschatology and Christian ethics. That's the reason why it looks so much like Christian ethics when it when it's put into practice. But it also has picked up on a lot of this, uh, a lot of the um, negative aspects of Marxism and liberal enlightenment 
in that it believes too readily in the perfectibility of man and the perfectibility of history. And uh, there's one thing that Marxism has demonstrated over and over again, and that is that you cannot bring about the kingdom of God if you don't believe in God. You, don't, you can't bring about the kingdom of God without God. That doesn't mean Christians are going to bring about the kingdom of God. That is very clear among Christian ethics. Christians are not going to bring about the kingdom of God. But neither are secular people going to bring it about. It's, it's got to be brought about, if it's going to be brought about at all, by a, by a um, religious theological understanding of the nature of God, the nature of man, and the nature of human society. So we will um, take up there next time. <laughs>